Good evening and welcome to Disclosure. I'm Diana Swain. We often see police making high-profile arrests or drug busts on television, but we rarely witness what came before, the months, perhaps years of investigation that led to that moment. Tonight, we have a real-life crime story captured on 60 hours of police video and audio tape. When we first saw this footage, we were surprised at what it showed. A well-known Vancouver businessman apparently agreeing to launder millions of dollars of Colombian drug money. It seemed almost unreal, so we tracked down the people who appear on those tapes. Now, it's rare that a victim of a sting would be prepared to speak on camera. Rarer still, the undercover officer, but they both agreed. Gillian Finley now on the cop and the laundry man. Call it Miami Vice, Canadian style. Just like on TV and in the movies, this city really is the drug smuggling capital of North America. All those piles of drug profits have to be laundered. So Miami is also where the drug lords come to hide their dirty money and to find a laundryman who can wash it through the system. The scene you're about to see, though, is not from a movie. It's a police surveillance tape. The man lugging the bags of cash calls himself Bill McDonald. I got 500 here. A front man for a Colombian drug cartel. The man with the wine and the stogie is a well-known Vancouver businessman named Martin Chambers. You need a fighter on your side who used to be at that level. What Chambers doesn't know is that the front man, Bill McDonald, is really Bill Miker, an undercover RCMP officer. People like Martin Chambers, they're facilitators. They're facilitators of death and destruction. Uh, based on, on pursuit of money. The only thing Chambers does know is that the RCMP have been after him for decades. There are a whole series of attempts on the part of the RCMP to have involved me, and quite simply, I'm not guilty of any criminal conduct. I've had my life turned upside down by the RCMP. It was one of the biggest white-collar crime stings ever conducted in North America. Operation Bermuda Short is what the FBI called it. And for three years, the RCMP worked jointly with the Americans, tracking fraudulent stock deals and the laundering of drug money. 58 people were eventually arrested, 20 of them Canadians. In the beginning, Martin Chambers wasn't even a target, officially. But by the time the operation was over, he was the RCMP's biggest prize. It all began with an investigation of one of Chambers' longtime Vancouver business associates. The Mounties soon learned that the FBI was also interested in the man, and so a decision was made to team up. The FBI took the lead, setting the scene like an elaborate movie. In one of Florida's fanciest marinas, they outfitted a yacht, hit a camera, wired it for sound. RCMP Corporal Bill Miker would play the starring role, a frontman for a fictitious Colombian drug lord named Ricardo. Once the trap was set, one of the first to take the bait was another Chambers associate, Kevin Gardner. It's April 9, 2002. Miker lugs in a gym bag packed with $500,000 Garner has agreed to launder. Uh, when I take delivery, okay. you just give me an account number or you can set up an account and keep. And in case the yeah. Colombians want to wash even more money, Garner says he knows just the man. Martin, is there an opportunity that you can come down and meet me here in Miami, Fort Lauderdale? Miker can't believe his luck. He hadn't set out to ensnare Martin Chambers, but now Gardner is unwittingly serving him up. Oh, Martin is fucking light years ahead of you. Will he understand that we're not fucking patches? Oh, you better make it clear to him. Hey, we'll give him the tools. He knows. He knows the fucking full game. In his rush to share the news with his FBI partner, Micah was so excited, he forgot he was still wired. Micah, still here. You know what? It's the bottom of the ice you out. I just hit a grand slam. The number one criminal in Western Canada is flying down tomorrow. He is the number one target in all of Western Canada. The most prolific. We, really, even the criminal code, Lex Luthor. 
I was uh, definitely excited. Lex Luthor, like in the criminal world, that's how they refer to Martin. I realized that uh, I was about to, uh, within the Canadian context anyways, uh, hit the, the highest level of uh, criminal. The man the RCMP labeled a comic book supervillain started out with lots of promise here in Vancouver. The son of a member of parliament, Martin Chambers graduated from Oxford and in 1967 became a lawyer. But within four years, Chambers was flirting with the wrong side of the law. First came an arrest for selling stolen pearls. He was eventually acquitted. A few years later, he was sentenced to nine years in jail for conspiring to import cocaine. Chambers appealed that conviction all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada and won, although the scandal cost him his license to practice. He was skirting the edge and going on the thin ice as uh, every opportunity he could take. Bob Mitchell has known Martin Chambers most of his life. A convicted trafficker himself, he says Chambers was no stranger to drugs or to the criminal world they fuel. If you're a really serious criminal, if you can run faster than they can, you'll always stay ahead of them. And Martin is a little, you know, fast. He takes a lot of cocaine to keep himself going. He's got the little end as long as he can keep on going faster than they can. He'll stay ahead of them. Chambers has always run with a fast crowd. He has long and well-known ties to the BC Hells Angels and to a number of underworld figures in Vancouver, some of whom met untimely and violent ends. Most recently, Chambers has been linked to a variety of financial schemes and scandals. As an investigator for Stockwatch, a Vancouver business news service, Brent Mudry has been tracking Martin Chambers for years. He's been one of those individuals who has been able uh, to skate off uh, from very close calls a number of times. He's really been a Teflon man. But not even Teflon lasts forever. In Florida, Martin Chambers was about to meet his match. It would take a boat, a bag full of cash, and a clever cop. As a 14-year veteran of undercover work, Miker knew his way around the drug world. You didn't have to go back and watch reruns of Miami Vice or something no, to figure no, it out. No, 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 nothing, <laughs> nothing like that. So all of a sudden, you're going to meet the mythological Martin Chambers. What was going through your mind? You know, uh, a little bit of butterflies. Martin, uh, without a doubt, is an extremely intelligent, uh, brilliant man. And I was uh, under no illusions that I was dealing with somebody uh, uh, who didn't know what he was doing. Their first meeting is April 11th, 2002, on a yacht in Fort Lauderdale's 15th Street Marina. This is crap. That snow crap is wonderful. Chambers has brought his wife. Kevin Garner is also there. They chat over a meal of crab, alligator, and other delicacies. And from the start, Chambers brags of his connections to organized crime. The upper echelon of the Russian mafia, for want of a better word, that we're generating all this cash. Then they get down to business. How much cash well, can they handle? Let's, let's, let's just round number. I'm not saying it's going to be this. But let's, let's work on $4 million a month. But Chambers wants to start off smaller. Uh, you know, uh, frankly, the, um, the amount that I would probably start with, half a million bucks level, would be my objective if everybody feels comfortable. Just over a month later, Martin Chambers is back in Florida to pick up the first installment. Good. Here. I got 500 here. What I've got. Oh, I know what you've got to get me. With no history, no fair enough, I'm going to get you get into the Indian power. Money. Power. Money. Money. Yeah. I've got 50,000 for ice, 40,000. Okay. I've got a lot of fire. I wanted to give you a bigger currency to. I don't mind the um, small bills I can do. The transaction takes only a few minutes, and Chambers leaves with bags of what he believes is Colombian cash. Martin is an absolute grinder. And if there was a nickel on the table, he would take it. I just gave him a, two bags with a half a million dollars. He stopped, put down the cash so he could wrap up the sandwiches to take back to his hotel with him. 
Three weeks later, Chambers and his associates are back for more. It's June 19th. This time, as requested, Miker has brought a money counter for the $200,000 on the table. I'm going to split it into two components, one of about 50,000, one hundred thousand. For a long time, all you can hear is the sound of the cash being counted. By now, Chambers and his partners have taken $700,000 from the people they thought were Colombians and are already washing it through the system. They divided the dirty money into smaller units, spread it through a myriad of U.S. bank accounts. Some money was filtered through the Royal Bank in Vancouver through one of Chambers' own companies. Once it was no longer traceable, the now clean money was transferred back to an account secretly controlled by the FBI. Chambers and his partners didn't know that, of course. All they cared about was their cut. This will all be yours. <laughs> but the celebration wouldn't last long. With everything now on videotape, the FBI and the RCMP were ready to pounce. On the morning of August 14th, the arrests began. Chambers was flying to Fort Lauderdale that day, making a connection in St. Louis. But at the St. Louis airport, FBI agents tailing Chambers noticed he was behaving strangely, talking continuously on cell phones. At one point, he left the terminal. Fearing he had learned of the roundup, the FBI jumped. Canada's Lex Luthor was under arrest. When we come back, in an exclusive interview, an angry Martin Chambers strikes back at the RCMP. They may have made a trap, they may have put the cheese in it, but you took the cheese. But I didn't take a cheese that, in my view, had any criminal origin to it. And that yet, is why it's a vendetta. And that yet, is why it is an absolutely outrageous interference and destruction. It had taken three years, but now the joint FBI-RCMP undercover operation was over. The money laundering sting had snagged 20 Canadian businessmen. Two things motivate these people, greed and ego. For Mountie Bill Miker, the biggest satisfaction was nabbing the infamous Martin Chambers. For Martin, actually it was easy because his ego was so great that uh, he couldn't believe that the, the great Martin Chambers could be, you know, sucked by the police. You know? Con couldn't be conned. Uh, exactly. The Mounties finally had Chambers where they'd long wanted him, in jail, albeit an American jail. Chambers waited for his trial at the Miami Detention Center, which is where we met him when he agreed to do an interview for the very first time. When did you realize that the man sitting across to you at that table was, in fact, an undercover police officer? Uh, the first time I realized that is when I was arrested in St. Louis. Lex Luthor, is that you? Yes, that's their allegation. I mean, they were ecstatic. They have been on my case from time immemorial. Simply because I don't like the RCMP, simply because over a period of 30 years, I've told them to go to hell in a handbasket, and I have not at any time done anything that they could convict me for. Even before trying to convict him this time, the authorities wanted to keep Chambers locked up to deny him bail. The Mounties flew down to testify at his bail hearing, arguing that Chambers was too dangerous to be released. They didn't provide much evidence, but they did tell the judge that Chambers was a person of interest in at least two murders back in Vancouver, including the execution of a former business associate who was tied to a cocaine deal that went sour. Absolutely no foundation to any of that. They turned all of British Columbia upside down and they found not one scrap of evidence. Not one scrap. Do you understand? The, you judge, can... the judge, after hearing the testimony, uh, came back and uh, says, uh, Chambers was suspected in Canada of having arranged the contract killing of, of an individual with a large-scale narcotics importation. There's no substance to? to that. It is absolutely untrue. In the end, the judge ruled there wasn't enough proof that Martin Chambers was a danger to society. So, after 11 months in detention, he was released on half a million dollars bail. But the judge imposed some very strict conditions. Chambers was not to leave his luxury condo here in Miami. He was to wear an electronic ankle bracelet at all times. His phone and his computer were to be monitored, 
and under no circumstances, the judge said, was Martin Chambers to have any contact with any of his co-defendants. Within days, Chambers was in trouble again. Remember Kevin Gardner, the Canadian businessman who telephoned Chambers and got him to Florida in the first place? He turned state's evidence and agreed to return to Florida to testify against Chambers. So did you get in touch with Martin? Uh -huh. This is a phone conversation taped by the FBI and later played in court between Garner and Chambers' business manager. The police allege Chambers sent $10,000 to pay for Gardner's legal fees and to ensure that he didn't leave Canada. And what's he so saying? You can tell Kevin, take my word for it. We'll continue to look after Kevin, period. Right. We'll keep paying everything he requests up here. But he just, he just wants me to stay up here through the next couple of weeks for the trial. That's correct. Phone records presented in court show that from Florida, Chambers was in regular contact with his manager from a cell phone he wasn't supposed to have. Alan Kaiser, one of the federal prosecutors assigned to the Chambers case, couldn't believe the nerve. You don't go and attempt to bribe witnesses before trial, and that's going to get your bond revoked, which happened in this case. Is that what Martin Chambers did? Martin Chambers was attempting to obstruct justice, and there was a hearing, it was presented to the court, and the court revoked his bond immediately. So Chambers was back in jail. The question was, could the police keep him there? He has always insisted he was the victim in all of this, an upstanding businessman lured to Miami by the RCMP bent on a vendetta. To convict him, the prosecution would have to prove two things, that Chambers laundered the money and that he believed the cash was the product of cocaine sales. This is a risky situation for us as you. The case would turn on the police surveillance tapes, and Chambers' own words certainly suggest that from the beginning, he knew the business was dicey. I'm 62 years old and I've got responsibilities. They don't consist of um, sitting in an American cell. Clearly you were concerned that something that you were doing might land you in an American jail. No, I was very concerned that if there was any criminal origin to this money, mm -hmm. that I could so end up. So what did you understand your role to be then? My role? To my, launder the my, cash? No, my role initially was not to launder the cash at all. My initial role was to take the funds and invest them. A strange way to invest. Chambers and his associates stored a lot of that cash in this Fort Lauderdale security company, renting a vault under the maiden name of Chambers' mother. And if he wasn't laundering money, what was Chambers talking about on this police surveillance audio tape? I can do the investment side. The laundering side, I'm learning. I'm learning what works, and I'm learning what doesn't work. You admit that you were, you were laundering money. You were laundering this money. That was the purpose of having you there. No, that's not a correct assessment. They put me in a position where they wanted the funds to be converted. Laundering is a casual term. You are effectively putting me on trial. You're asking leading and specific questions. I'm asking you to explain when you and use the word that. laundering in that conversation, did you not mean you were laundering the money? I did not mean that I was laundering money in a fashion that had any criminal origins whatsoever. Laundering money is always criminal, but did Chambers know that the bags of cash he was hauling off that yacht was Colombian drug money? He's adamant he thought it was the proceeds of legitimate business. And then he's saying to me, and, and he's sitting there like all the time before he was, all of a sudden he's smiling at me like I'm his best friend. But listen to asking. this tape. Undercover right, agent sir. Bill Miker is telling Chambers that one of Chambers' partners has just asked him specifically, where did the money come from? I'm fucking looking at this guy. I'm looking at him. You know, yeah, yeah, fucking cocaine, K-O-K-A-N-E. What are you, fucking moron? I mean, in, in fact, I blew him up. I just laughed at him. Are you fucking kidding me? I mean, of course, this is cocaine money. Like, that's why I would rather deal with professionals. Exactly. I don't want to meet people. I mean, Martin, you know what we're talking about here. I mean, let's, let us agree right now. We know exactly what we're talking about. I knew exactly what was being talked about, and it wasn't cocaine. He's being completely facetious about the whole thing. I mean, I took that as a complete joke. Mr. Chambers, I've, I've looked at the tape. It's pretty I, clear to me that he's talking about cocaine. Then you reach your conclusion. I'm being boxed 
by this officer who knows what he wants to put in front of me and he knows how he's got to try and trap me. He could have easily said, this is cocaine money. And if he told you it was cocaine money, what would you have done? Of course I'd have left instantaneously. Well, you know, if I said it that bluntly, listen, Martin, this is the proceeds of cocaine sales. You know, if, if, a, if a light bulb didn't go on in his head at that point, then, then uh, there's something seriously wrong. Mm -hmm. That's just not the way, you know, criminals uh, talk, in my experience, anyway. So there was no doubt in your mind that there was an Zero understanding? Doubt. Zero doubt. And in the end, there was no doubt in the minds of 12 jurors either. It took the Miami jury just three and a half hours to convict Martin Chambers of five counts of laundering cocaine money. In America, a very serious crime. When we met Chambers, it was December 4th, the eve of his sentencing. Tomorrow, you're going to be sentenced. Yeah, and I'll get a very long sentence. What are you preparing yourself for? I'm preparing a sentence that is a death warrant. You don't think you're going to get out of prison? Uh, I would uh, never uh, get out of a U.S. prison. The next morning, Bill Miker, now Inspector Miker, was in Miami to attend the sentencing that police had been hoping for for so many years. That'll yeah, be a good day, hopefully. But for Martin Chambers, it would not be a good day. Two days before his 64th birthday, the U.S. judge sent him away for a total of 15 years and eight months. You know what, I'd be, I'd be lying to say I didn't feel a, you know, a great sense of pride and accomplishment. Martin Chambers is a bit of a pathetic figure right now, 64 years old. He's looking, by his own admission, probably at spending the rest of his life in jail. He calls it a death sentence. Do you have any sympathy for him? I have none. I, uh, you know, Martin Chambers is the, is the master of his own demise. And so Martin's run out of gas, in a sense. But he'll recharge his batteries, and he'll be up and running again. Don't count Martin Chambers out yet, says his old friend Bob Mitchell. The thing about Martin is, is that he's got this sort of chip on his, on his shoulder about the forces of authority and all that. You know, if he can find a way of sticking a stick in the police eye, he sticks at it. And true to form, Chambers is trying to stick it to the Mounties by targeting them in his appeal. It turns on an intriguing point of law. When the RCMP operates abroad, does it have an obligation to uphold the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Chambers argues that by luring him to Florida, the RCMP violated his rights, and as a result, he should be freed. It's true those videotapes the police relied on would be much harder to get in Canada. Under Canadian law, a judge's permission is needed to secretly record someone. In the U.S., police can make that call themselves. They're looking to move people into the United States, and they're looking to use the U.S. A lack of protection in terms of wiretapping and in terms of uh, sting operations. They moved into the United States so that they could achieve in the United States what they couldn't achieve in Canada. Chambers' lawyers obtained these RCMP memos that indeed show the Mounties believed there was, quote, a stronger likelihood of conviction against Chambers in the U.S. system. And remember that cell phone call Bill Miker made when he first heard Chambers was coming to Florida? He couldn't have been happier that Chambers might be nailed in the States. Just what? Right, it's flying down tomorrow, okay? Whatever it takes so I can get him. And you know what? We don't want him under the jurisdiction. No fucking teeth in the law. So we prosecute them down here. Go ahead. When you say we don't want them in our jurisdiction, it's got no F and teeth. Well, that's just my opinion, not necessarily sure. the opinion of the RCMP. Sure. I uh, dealt with another significant money launderer in Vancouver a number of years ago, mm -hmm. and it involved uh, over $20, 30000000 million. This fellow got two years less a day and didn't spend one day in jail on money laundering. So wow. you decide if it's if it's appropriate. It's clear that Chambers is going to use this as part of his appeal. Do you worry that, uh, you know, a judge could look at this and say, well, you know, maybe this was malicious at some level? No, not at all. Uh, Martin Chambers came into this undercover operation of his own free will. And uh, he created his own demise the minute he got on a plane to chase the money. And the fact it was here was just your good fortune? Absolutely. Just, uh, it was a very... Uh, convenient uh, convergence. Where you should be looking at is they arrest all these Canadians. Mm -hmm. They are brought down here. Mm -hmm. They are in 
vagal in the coming here, and then they are given a series of inducements, but which are designed. But you took the inducement. Yes. They may have made a trap, they may have put the cheese in it, but you took the cheese. But I didn't take a cheese that, in my view, had any criminal origin to it. You still took those bags of cash. Because the bags of cash were not, in my view, anything that was illegal. But nevertheless, you were sitting in Florida, you, you committed the acts that you did, you say that, 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 uh, that, that you didn't know it was cocaine money, a jury disagreed with you, you've been convicted in the United States. They created a situation, I stupidly, criminally or otherwise set foot in it and I'll bear the results of that for the rest of my life. Well, maybe not. In the U.S., Chambers will have to serve nearly 14 years before he's even eligible for parole. If he were in a Canadian prison, however, he would be out much, much sooner. And so Martin Chambers is hoping to pull one more trick. He hopes to get transferred back to Canada under a special treaty, and if he succeeds, the RCMP's Lex Luthor could be a free man in just a few years.